Good morning. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. That, my friends, is the cost of discipleship. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that commemorates Jesus' entry into Jerusalem about a week before his death. In Luke's Gospel, in the 19th chapter, we learn about what happened When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where, on entering, you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it, just as he had told them, And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. For all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known the day the things that make for peace, or on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because though they praised God with their lips, their hearts were far from him. Though they claimed to know God and to have a relationship with God, here was the Son of God in the flesh in front of them. And they did not recognize him. And they did not obey him. And they did not follow him. And they had every evidence in the world. When people say, oh, if only God showed me some sign, I would believe That is not true. That is not true. Because these people saw signs, many signs. As a matter of fact, if you read in the Gospel of John in chapter 11, Jesus goes to the grave of his friend Lazarus, who's been in the grave for four days. He says, remove the stone from the grave. They say, Lord, he's been in there four days. He's going to smell. But they remove the stone anyway. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out! Lazarus, the dead man, comes out wrapped like he's a mummy, all right? He comes out of the grave like that. He says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And then the very next thing you'll see if you read the Gospel of John chapter 11, the very next thing the Pharisees tried to do, who saw that, who they were there with him said, we need to kill this man. We need to, first of all, we need to re-kill Lazarus. (laughs) We need to get rid of Jesus. Ah, what? You just saw Jesus raise a man from the dead, and you want to destroy him? You refuse to believe? Uh, See, that's the key. They refused to believe. Evidence had no place in their faith or lack of faith. It was a willingness not to believe. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem 
In another place, he says, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. They praised God with their lips. Their hearts were far from him. And though the religious leaders displayed some outward conformity to the letter of the law, they did not care one whit about the spirit of the law and about the one who gave the law. And that kind of outward conformity, God does not honor He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants your heart to be set toward Him. If your heart is set toward Him, then you will obey Him. You won't obey Him out of some kind of duty like, well, God says I have to do this thing. I guess I will. You'll obey him and say, yes, Lord, you're my Savior. You're my Lord. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in your sufferings, becoming like you in your death, so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's what Paul wanted. At one time, he wanted to kill Jesus, and then he met Jesus personally, and now he wants to follow him. I want to know you. No matter what it costs me, I want to know Christ. It's the most important thing to Paul. It's the most important thing to me. Is it the most important thing to you? It doesn't mean that we're always going to be perfect in that desire. It doesn't mean that we're not going to fall back into the ways of our flesh. And we're going to see that in our passage today from 1 John chapter 2. We're going to see that. Walking with Christ doesn't necessarily mean we walk perfectly with Christ. Matter of fact, because while we're in this flesh, John's been saying, we've been learning ever since the first chapter of John, uh, 1 John, that if we say we don't have sin, then we're lying, okay? It's just a part of this world. It's a part of this flesh. But are you walking with him? Do you love him? Is your heart set toward him? That's the question. That's the question. May the Lord... Speak to us today through our passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace, because without that, there's, first of all, no way that we could ever know you. And secondly, uh, there's no way that we could be forgiven. Lord, we need that. We need your forgiveness, and we need the knowledge of you. And we need to have a heart that is close to you. Lord, even if there are people in this room whose hearts are far from you, now I pray, Father, that you would draw them. Draw them to yourself. Draw them to your Son by the power of the Spirit. Lord, speak to us through your word today. Give us your word now, Lord. You are the God who speaks, the God who exists, and the God who speaks. You are not like the deaf and dumb and blind idols of man's own creation. You are the creator God, and you care about us enough to speak to us and to give us your word. And so, Lord, help us now incline our ears to listen to the creator of everyone, to the creator of everything, because you love us, because you would have us to come to you and to obey you for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 3, we'll read um, 3 to 6 to begin. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. How do you know if you really know God? This is a really an, uh, an amazing thing. We can know God. 
know him, not just know about him, we can actually know him. We can have a relationship with God in love, mutual love. He loves us and we love him and he communes with us in his word and we commune with him in prayer. We have a relationship together and someday for those of us who know him, we will see him then face to face. Right now we don't see. When Thomas said to Jesus, Oh, my Lord and my God. Because he said, I will not believe until I put my finger in the holes in his hand and put my hand in his side. After Jesus had died and, and then his, the other disciples saw Jesus and they said, He's alive again. Thomas said, uh, You know, I won't believe it unless I can do that. And then Jesus appears to him. He says, Here. All right. Put your finger here. Put your hand on my side. Stop doubting. Believe. Thomas falls down and says, oh, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Which, if you are a believer in Christ, that is every single person in this room. We believe we have not seen him face to face yet. And he says we're blessed. If you believe and you haven't seen Jesus, you're blessed. Amazing. But someday we will see him. Until then, we can still have a relationship with him. We can know him. So the question is, how do you know if you know him? How does a person know if they're really a Christian? A true Christian bears the fruit of his faith. It flows out of their faith. That's why James said, faith without works is dead. In James chapter 2, James talks about that. Now, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, but, but, that faith does not stay alone. It changes us. We're regenerated. We become a different person than we were before. Let me ask you, friend, are you a different person now than you were before you knew Christ? For those of you who can remember a time before you knew Christ, some of you came to Christ when you were very little. Some of you came when you were five, six years old, even. Lord, came into your heart, convicted your little mind of sin. You don't listen to mama. <laughs> All right. And in your mind, you said, I repent. And you believed in the Lord, and to this day you've been following him. You might not remember what it was like to be a four-year-old and disobey and live for your flesh and for the devil. But I know that there are some people in this room who do remember what it was like before you were saved. Is your life different now? Has God made any discernible difference in your life? Can you tell? Are you bearing fruit? See, fruit is not something like true Christian fruit. True obedience is not something that like, well, I believe so I got to obey. Something that flows out of your faith. It's, it comes, I mean, it's supernatural because faith in itself is supernatural, but it flows out of it. Naturally, it naturally, supernaturally flows out of it. <laughs> all right, if you, if you feel me there, huh? all right. It comes out of your faith, and it's something which will happen. It just, it just will happen if you believe. John 14, 23 to 24, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. All right, that's also, oh, I don't have like two more hours to talk about that. We will come to him and make our home with him. Wow, that's so awesome. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. This is very simple. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to my Father who sent me. Obedience to the Lord is a sign of our love for him and intimate knowledge of him. Our obedience does not lead to salvation, but salvation leads to obedience. I. Howard Marshall, the great uh, Bible commentator who recently died, unfortunately. He's in, unfortunately for us, he's in heaven though now. He said, knowledge of God was a favorite theme of ancient religion. It was particularly common in a group of uh, religions which have become known as Gnostic. The Gnostics believed that there was this kind of mystical experience or direct vision of the divine. And this epistle in 1 John suggests that John's opponents were not too concerned about sin, 
and evil in their life or overcoming it. They did not think that sin was a barrier to fellowship with God. They just wanted some experience. So that's why John is saying, look, if you really want to know, if you know God, you know, you, you claim you have all these experiences. You claim to have these mystical things happening to you, which, you know, there's a form of Gnosticism today. You can just see it on the television, on TBN or one of those uh, stations there. Actually, I would recommend you don't watch that. It's all about experience and not about obedience. And John says, forget that. Listen, you want to know if you know God? Do you obey him? That's the question. Do you obey him? Here then is the test by which we can be sure that we know God. It may be hard to know whether one's spiritual experience is genuine, is a genuine knowledge of the invisible God. I mean, Joseph Smith had an experience. He said an angel named Moroni came to him and gave him some tablets in ancient Egyptian and said that Jesus came to America, okay, and started the religion called Mormonism, which is a false religion, a false cult. It says that God the Father was once a human being and that we can become gods of our own planets and all that kind of crazy stuff. But he had an experience. I would say probably a demon came to him and gave him that experience. Or... There was another person I can think of that had an experience, which was a false experience. His name was Mohammed. He said that an angel came to him and told him that Jesus is not the Son of God, that God doesn't have a son, and all of this. And, well, we have Islam today, false religion, all right? And those were based on experiences and not on the true word of God. It's much easier to look at one's own conduct to see whether it is in conformity with God's commands. Okay, but here's the difficulty. If keeping the commands is a sign of knowing God, while walking in sin and walking in darkness is a sign of ignorance of God, here's the question. How absolute are these conditions? How absolute are they? It would surely be unreasonable to say that perfect obedience is the necessary sign of true spiritual knowledge. Otherwise, John would be contradicting his own teaching that none of us can say that we're without sin. He says, none of us can say that. And so when he says, if you want to know if you know God, do you obey him? Then, you know, on what is he, what is he basing uh, the sort of level of obedience? The question is whether, really, whether I'm wanting and desiring and making an effort to, and to some extent succeeding in keeping God's commands. So the question that begs to be asked is this, what exactly is it that Jesus commands us to do? If John says, uh, this is how, uh, by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments, okay, so then, what are his commandments? He commands us to repent. To repent. If we're in sin, he tells us to turn from it. Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He commands us to believe. He commands you to believe in him. Let not your hearts be troubled, he says in John 14, 1. Believe in God, believe also in me. If you don't believe, you're not obeying his command. He commands us to love. Matthew 16, 24 to 25, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 10, 37. Then I was reading the next one. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He commands us to take up our cross and follow him in Matthew 16. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He commands us to fear God in Matthew, in, uh, Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill, kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And not only these, Jesus commands us to worship God in spirit and truth, to always pray and not lose heart, to not be anxious about our daily life. Oh, he commands you not to be anxious about your daily life. To humble ourselves, to control our anger, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love our enemies, to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven, to stay married, to remember him through communion, to let our light shine before others, to make disciples of all nations. This is the cost of discipleship. Amen. There's no such thing as a halfway Christian. Look at verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. 
There's no such thing as a halfway Christian. If you don't care about following what Jesus says, then you don't care about Jesus, period. You cannot separate his commands from his person. There are plenty of people who are like, yeah, I'm, I'm like Jesus, man. He's my homeboy. He's cool. I like him and he likes me, but their lives are the opposite of what a disciple should be. John says that they're liars. If someone knows Christ in a saving way, their lives are changed. They're not the same as before. They love Christ and they live for Christ. Jesus hates lukewarm Christianity. In Revelation chapter 3, he writes to a church at a place called Laodicea. And he says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich why in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He writes that to the church at Laodicea, a church which had thought that they were rich. Listen now, Woo. I'm going to say something that might get me in a little bit of trouble, but I say it in love now, all right? May God prevent this church from ever being the church of Laodicea. Laodicea said, ah, we are rich. There could be a temptation if we sell the 82 acres of land that we own to say, ah, we are rich. And if we are not rich here in our hearts toward God, then we are just like them. May God prevent this church from ever becoming that lukewarm Yes, yeah, sort of. We call, I mean, the name of our church is Crossview. We have a view of the cross. We don't really live for that, but we look at it and we come here and sit in the pews and we don't get involved and we don't really care and we don't serve our neighbors. May God have mercy on us if we are that. I don't want to be that. I know you don't want to be that. <clears throat> God forbid that we would be a lukewarm church. Now, some of you might be feeling despair. After I read all those commandments, after I read all those things, <laughs> like, God commands you not to be anxious about your daily life, and you're like, oh, but I am anxious all the time. I'm constantly anxious. I know. I know. Or any of these other things. Controlling your anger, loving your neighbor, laying up your treasure in heaven. Loving, believing, repenting, taking up your cross. Maybe you're having difficulty in all of those areas. I want to say something about that. Our adversary, the devil, wants two different things for two different groups of people. This is what the devil wants. Listen very, very carefully. For unbelievers in the church, if there are unbelievers sitting in the church right now, which there very well may be. He wants you to be comfortable in your unbelief. He wants you to be comfortable. He wants you to think, oh, that pastor, what does he know? Look how strict he is, how judgmental. Salvation is not by works of the law after all, right? Isn't that what you all preach? Salvation isn't by works of the law. It's by grace. So who cares about doctrine? Who cares about righteousness and holy living? I don't have to be holy because isn't Jesus holy on my behalf? That's the devil's logic. Devil has his own logic, all right? You don't have to be holy. Jesus is holy for you. So, so what? He wants you to be comfortable in your unbelief, and he accomplishes that in many cases through a false view of the gospel called antinomianism. Let's say that together, antinomianism. Antinomianism, or in other circles it's called hyper-grace. Uh, these positions teach that 
Because of the merits of Christ, Christians have no obligation to live uprightly at all. That you can live for sin and hell and the devil and still be saved. That works have no place at all in the Christian life. But antinomianism is rebuked by John in verse 4. And it is rebuked by James in James 2, who says, if you don't have works which follow your faith, if those works are not there, and your faith is not real, if you're not living for Jesus, then your faith is never real. It's a, it's a dead faith. It's a false faith. To those slumbering right now under the warm, electric devil's blanket of antinomian licentiousness. How do you like that sentence that I wrote there? Ooh, I'm going to say it again now. <laughs> to those slumbering right now under the warm, electric devil's blanket of antinomian licentiousness, I say to you in the name of Jesus Christ, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Awake. You're on the fast road to hell. And you do not know whether at the end of this service, if I preach long enough, you may already be there. <laughs> Turn. Turn to Christ. Repent of your apathy toward God. That's John's point here. Now, as I said, the devil wants to do two different things in two different groups of people. For unbelievers in the church, he wants you to be comfortable in your unbelief. But listen now, for true believers, what does the devil want? For true believers, he wants to take away your assurance. All right? That's what the devil wants. He doesn't want you to be a Christian who has assurance of eternal life. Because a Christian who has assurance of eternal life is a powerful adversary to the kingdom of darkness. That's the reason why. That's the reason why. As I read those last four verses here, by this we know we've come to know him if you keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word in him truly love God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. As I read those verses, did a little voice say to you, you don't keep God's commandments and his word. The love of God is not perfected in you. Look, even now you're holding a grudge. You're even holding a grudge against the person who kind of smells that's sitting next to you. Even in this service, you've experienced lustful thoughts while you're sitting here. What kind of a Christian are you? You're not a child of God. Do you walk in the same way in which Jesus walked? These are serious questions. Really serious questions. What do we do with that? Listen, like Paul, John makes no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The true Christian is a new creation, though not yet perfect. And that's the context of verse 5, which seemed to be a promise for the future. In verse 5 it says, whoever keeps, his command, uh, whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. That this is a promise moving forward that we are being perfected in the love of God. The love of God is being perfected in us and changing us. And his love, therefore, is flowing out of us in a more and more perfect way the longer and longer we walk with him. The longer we walk with Jesus, the more we should be loving. It's being made perfect. So then the question for the one who professes to have faith is less a question of have you done this sin or that sin, but are you abiding in Christ or are you outside of Christ? Are you living in the light, being more and more perfected in love, or are you living in the darkness and harboring ill will toward God and man? Are you pursuing Christ or something else? How do you know? Let me ask you this. Has your heart and mind and will changed since coming to know Christ? Has Jesus made a discernible difference in your life? Jesus tells us what the greatest commandment is in Mark chapter 12, 28 to 31. A man came up to him and said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, The greatest is this. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So are you pursuing Christ, following him? Are you loving God? 
with your heart and mind and soul and strength. I think that these things, uh, I need to just take a little bit of time to break it down. What does it mean? Loving God with your mind means believing right things about Him. Now, that's not the only way for us to love God. And if we only say that we love God with our mind and not with our heart and with our will, then it's not really a true love of God. It's just an intellectual assent. We can, there are people like the Pharisees who give intellectual assent to the truths of the Scripture, but they don't really love God. So, but that is a part, because if we don't love God with our mind, if we don't believe right things about Him, how can you love Him if you don't really know about Him? You've got to love Him with your mind. You've got to love Him with your heart. Are your affections growing? Your love for Christ growing deeper and deeper? In your innermost being, do you want to follow him because of your love for him? Now, some people only have what they call a love for him, and it's an and it's they're like completely ignorant of who he is. They have some, well, that's sort of, I I think, what the Gnostics were going after a little bit, that, that that as long as you can have some ecstatic experience, some lovely affection, something like that well, then you can know him. And John says, no, no, that's not the only part. You also have to have the third part, which is your will, your strength. Do you love God with your strength? Are you acting in line with what he would have you to do? When we don't, do we confess? You know, confession is also an act of obedience. So loving God with our mind, with our heart, with our will... Are you, I mean, all of these things are involved. Some have one more than others, and we're not going to love God perfectly with all of these things in this life, and some people have a more intellectual-minded faith, and some people are more uh, passionate, and, and I was talking with my friend the other day who, who said, you know, I might be able to argue with a little old lady, and I might have some understanding of the Bible that's deeper than hers, but maybe her love for God is way deeper than mine. You know, that's possible. But in some measure, all of these things have to be there in order for the love of God to be true. Mind, heart, will. And if the mind and the heart and the will, the strength, are engaged for Christ, then sanctification and walking with Christ will follow. But sometimes, friends... Sin follows us from our flesh as well. Sin does. And, you know, I'm thinking about the man right now who, at one time, he was sleeping around. Didn't have really much of a conscience about it. It's something that his friends would do as well. And, you know, maybe there was some worldly twinge of guilt or his conscience was pricked a little bit but but not in a godly way and he was sleeping around and all of that and maybe he had you know even looked at pornography since he was a little kid and then someone shared the gospel with that man and the Lord saved him and he was changed there's he really made a a, a firm decision that because of my love for Christ I'm not going to do that anymore. He broke off his relationship with his girlfriend that he was with, happened to be with at that time. And, but, you know, he had been looking at porn since he was 12, and it's, and it's so pervasive, and he opened an email, and like, bam, it's there, and he like got sucked into that, you know, and he's like a brand new Christian, and, and ah, and he's wrestling, and there, there's this, now his conscience is really on fire because, you know, before he wouldn't have thought ever about looking at pornography, but now it's like, oh Lord, who shall rescue me from this body of death? Ah! And he confesses it, and he asks his friend, I need to download Covenant Eyes on my computer. Will you be my Covenant Eyes accountability partner, this awesome website that he found, and w- will you be that for me? And his friend says, yes, absolutely. So he'll get a report of everything he sees, and that report deters him from going on pornography websites. And he walks, he's walking with Christ, and progressing in his faith, 
and he comes to a place where that's not even an issue for him anymore. He's not looked at porn for a long time. But he'll catch himself sometimes if he's in a crowd. He'll catch himself like, here's a beautiful woman who just walked in front of me who's not my wife, he said. And he spent a little too long looking at her and lust was still there because he's still in the flesh. And he feels, that man who's listening to my sermon right now feels like, what about me? Am I walking with Christ? Am I? Because I'm not obeying. What does Christ say? If you lust for a woman, you've already committed adultery within, with her in your heart. You know, friends, the closer we come to Christ, the closer we walk with Jesus, the more our sins impact us the more we feel how bad they really are. That same man, when he was way over here doing something which, I mean, we can like categorically, objectively say, like actually being promiscuous and licentious in that way is probably ob objectively a worse thing than entertaining for a moment. Lust, all right? Objectively, we can say that, even though the root is the same. It's from the heart. It's the root, okay? The root is the same sin. But here, he didn't feel guilty at all. Wasn't even a part of it. And as he's walking with Christ, he's all the way over here, like, totally different person. If anyone looked at his life, if anyone outside of him looked at his life, they would say, you're a totally different man than you were before. I remember, you were a dog. You were a dog, boy. But I've, if, if we went to his accountability partner, the one that, that has his covenant eyes, and he asked him, his, his accountability partner would be like, man, you've had, like, a clean... Report for the last 12 years. Like, what are you talking about? I think, friends, that um, sometimes we don't acknowledge the victories that God does give us in our walk with him. And I think that we should acknowledge those things. And it's not to say that harboring lust in one's heart or looking in, you know, like that at a woman passing by and, and then like, whoa, what am I doing? Like, oh my goodness, you know, that, that that's good or okay or excusable. Of course it's not. Of course it's not. What I'm saying is this, is that person who is here, are they walking with Christ? Yes. The fact that he says, ah, Lord, I'm still a debtor to your grace. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? He walks for another 60 more years. Do you know when he comes up to the temple to pray, he's going to say, oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's going to say the same thing. Even though he might be progressing in, in holiness, walking with Christ, being sanctified, even the closer he comes to Jesus, the more he acknowledges, I am the chief of sinners. Paul writes that. Paul writes, I'm the chief of... I think, come on, Paul. Come on. You're the chief of... If you're the chief of sinners, then what am I? The, the king of hell? <laughs> I mean... Like, like, seriously. No, the reason why Paul could write that he is the chief of sinners is because the closer he walks with Jesus, the more he sees any sin in his life as an egregious sin against the holy God. And the more he sees his absolute need of grace. Absolute. And you know, lest I just apply that example to just men in the room, you know. I mean, and, not, and also, you know, just know men can be guilty of this particular sin that I'm about to tell you as well. But let's say that there's a woman who loves to gossip Loves it. Busy body. Loves to gossip. Tells all her friends all the juiciest details. All right? Unbeliever. Doesn't love Jesus. Just gossiper, gossiper, gossip, 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 gossip. 
And then someone shares the gospel with her. She's saved. She's a new Christian. And then she hears this juicy bit of like, ee, from one of her old friends. She hears it and she's tempted. She like wants to go tell everybody about it. And she's like, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. But I'll tell like my three best friends. I'll just tell them. I'm not going to tell the whole office. I'll just tell my friends. Eee! And then when she does that, then she reads the scripture which says, do not be a gossip. And, ah, she's convicted. She confesses. She confesses her sins. She's walking with Christ. She hears another bit of gossip a long way down the road. She doesn't say anything to anybody about it. But in her heart, she's like, I never did like that girl. Never did like her anyway. I always knew that about her. I knew it. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I knew it. And the Holy Spirit convicts her. You need to love. You need to see your own self. You need to see your own heart. You need to love that person and not hold bitterness in your heart. Ah, Lord, you're so right. You're right. I see it. I see myself. Is that woman walking with Christ? Is she obeying the command of Christ? Yes. That doesn't mean that harboring anger and bitterness and all of that in her heart is good. It's not. It's not good. But she's confessing it. She wants to be clean from that. She wants to have victory over that. Listen, that's what the Christian life looks like for all of us. And if you say that it doesn't, if you think that you've already arrived, then like I said last week then, I just want to talk to your spouse then. You know. Because I think that they'll give me a, a different opinion about that. Moral reform in and of itself is not a sure sign of saving faith. It's not. A person who's over here who's gossiping or having sex or whatever, drinking, whatever the thing is, you can make, pick a million different sins, all right? Whatever that is, just because their life is different 10 years down the road, listen, a person can go to prison and become, you know, a, a Muslim and uh, reform their life and be away from those kind of temptations and their life is totally different than it was before. That doesn't mean that it's from God. Doesn't mean that. Moral reform in and of itself does not mean that it is saving faith. But saving faith is life-changing and transformative. Our love for God becomes complete when it expresses itself in acts of obedience. The more we love Him, the more we will obey Him. And the more we obey Him out of that love, the more His love for us is manifested in our lives, which leads us to having a heart for others and obedience to God instead of being a chore becomes joy. Obedience to God instead of being something hard becomes something that I really want to do. It becomes our pleasure. I just want to read the rest of this passage, and we can go on. We can finish. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What does John mean here with old commandment and new commandment? Well, the commandment to love and obey God and to love others is from the beginning. It was the loving God who told Adam, do not eat from the tree which I, I'm commanding you, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam's disobedience brought misery into the world. John is telling us that he's not saying anything new. And yet, at the same time, it is a new commandment. It's a new commandment because of verse 8. Look at verse 8 again. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Well, let's let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we can understand what John is talking about. In Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 3, here's what Paul says about that. 
For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, and it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, for those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, Paul is explaining it in this way. Paul says here that the flesh is so weak that following the law cannot bring about salvation. The fault is not with the law. The law is holy and righteous and good. But the flesh is weak. Our flesh is so weak. We don't have the ability in our flesh to follow the law. And that's why John says the old commandment, this commandment to obey and love and trust and serve God and love others, it's always been there. But you never had the ability to actually fulfill it. You didn't have the ability to walk in it. Until now. Until now. Because the light has dawned. And what Paul says and what John says is this. Before we came to know Christ, we were continually defeated by sin. But now, through Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God gives us strength. That's why John says he's giving us a new commandment. Because in Christ, we walk by the Spirit And we're able to obey it. It's new to us. It's new to us now. Because to us now, we can actually love. We can love people. We can forgive people who hurt us. Before, I mean, I just know in my own, oh man, I just know in my own history, in my own flesh, I lived in a house where if someone hurt me, I was taught to hurt them twice as bad. I was taught that way. That's the only way to deal with conflict. I was taught that. It was ingrained in me. That's some part of my flesh. I know that not everyone was taught that way. I know not everyone has that same struggle that I do. But forgiveness of others has been so hard It's just naturally hard for me to do. I hold on to things. My mother used to say to me as a little child, man, if someone hurts you, you just cut them off and never talk to them again. I remember my mom saying that to me. Like, I wouldn't, I would say, I don't want to hang out with that boy anymore, ever. Never want to see his face ever again. My mother would say to me, that's not right. But I had no strength to overcome that. None at all. It's just who I was, how I was, how I am, until Christ, until Christ came into my life, gave me the ability to forgive, and to saw I saw how much I was forgiven, and He He has given me that strength. Is it still a struggle with me to overcome when somebody hurts me? Yes, it is. But I'm not the man I was before. I'm not the man I'm going to be. But I'm not the man I was before. We can obey God now. We can trust in Christ and serve Christ because the Spirit of God dwells within us. We can love others. One of the best tests of whether or not we're walking in the Spirit and walking in light is if we love our brother. That's what he says in verses 9 to 11. Is that taking place in your life? Are you holding a grudge not just against Joe Schmo? I mean against your parents, against your spouse, against the people in this church. If so, bring it into the light. Sin dies in the light. Sin dies in the light. It's like a gremlin. A gremlin can't be in the light. You ever see that? It was my favorite movie as a kid. Gremlins. If you put a gremlin in the light, they're going to die. All right? Sin is like a gremlin. You can't bring it into the light or it'll die. That's what you should do. Bring it there. If you're holding on to that. Confess. Ask the Lord to take your life and consecrate it to himself today. I'm going to close with this. In February 1874... The poet Francis Ridley Havergal, my, my favorite poet, was visiting a home where ten people lived, and some of them were believers and some were not. But all the people in the home were unhappy, and she spent the evening sharing the gospel with those people. And before she left, all of them were converted. Amazing. Amazing thing. 
And as she lay in bed that night, after she saw this amazing work of God in these people's hearts, as she lay in bed that night, suddenly she got up and she took her quill and she wrote down these words. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Let's pray. Oh, Father. May that be true for us. Take our lives, Lord. Let them be ever only all for Thee. Give us the obedience which comes from faith. Lord, I pray for every single person in this room that our religion would not be one of tongue only, but of life and action and heart. Lord, thank you so much for your word which comforts us. Thank you that you've given us the true signs of what a disciple is. Be with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.